So now we fast forward uh, five years. Uh, here is Alberto Dinelli. He was in the court uh, 2019-21 uh, during COVID. <laughs> so <laughs> he, yes. And um, well, now he's in uh, in uh, Paris and is is working on uh, uh, bacterial ecosystems, and uh, he will tell us something. Thank you. So thank you so much for inviting me here. It's a real pleasure, also because it's basically my first Spring College live. So happy to be here. And yeah, um, I'm now working. I'm a PhD student now working at Université Paris Cité. Um, I'm working under the supervision of uh, Professor Julien Tailleur, and I met him during my, my PCS master, actually. He was a professor at my second year in France, and so I decided to, to continue working with him uh, for my PhD thesis, and now I'm, uh, today I'm going to discuss one work that we have been uh, doing about the self-organization of bacterial ecosystems from the microscopic to the macroscopic scale. So the field that I'm working on is active matter, and I don't know if you are familiar with that, so I'll try to give the grounds on, on this subject. So by active matter, we define those systems whose uh, microscopic units uh, dissipate energy to exert some non-conservative propulsion forces, and these are ubiquitous in biology at all scales. So basically, you can, go, uh, you can go to the microscopic scale and look at the bacteria. Well, bacteria, they use the energy coming from their metabolism to move their flagellum and thus to self-propel. If you go to the scale, to the animal scale, uh, birds are a good example of a, an active system because they use the energy to move their wings, so to fly. And we are active particles in a way because we walk. So that's another way in which we, we can be defined as active particles. And what I'm particularly interested in is the emergence of collective phenomena in active systems. So here I'm showing three different examples uh, drawn from the, from the three previous uh, biological uh, examples that I was making. So here on the left you can see the emergence of ring patterns in uh, Escherichia coli. And I will go into these in the next slide, so uh, don't worry about that for the moment. Uh, I just think it's a nice picture. Um, then, the second example is way more clear, I think. It's the flocking of birds. So you see the emergence of, uh, of a collective behavior by the fact that all these particles align to their neighbors, and so they get this collective motion. But also another example is, uh, at the human scale, the emergence of collective oscillations in crowd. And that's something that has been studied, for example, by the group of Denis Bartolo and Dion. So the key uh, element here is the fact that there is a feedback control over motility. So I look at the agents around me, and based on that, I decide how to update my motion rules. And as I was telling you, I want to look at the case of bacteria. So here on the left, you can see a single trajectory for E. coli. That's something that has been tracked uh, back in uh, 1972, so that's uh, like 50 years ago. And here you can see the motion of one single E. coli bacterium. So I want to start from this scale, the micrometric scale, and go up to the one of the Petri dish, so something around 10 centimeters. And how to do that? Um, well, as a statistical physicist, I'll try to model the trajectory of uh, these uh, bacterium as a run and tumble motion. The idea is that these particles self-propel with a given self-propulsion speed v, uh, along an orientation vector that's uh, dictated by this theta angle in 2D. And then at stochastic times, uh, they abruptly change their orientation, which gives rise to this fragmented trajectory here. So the idea is uh, what we would like to do is to go from microscopic to macroscopic. So first of all, I need to define the microscopic interactions are at play in this uh, system, and then coarse grain the microscopic dynamics into a macroscopic field theory. And once we have that, what we would like to achieve is an understanding and possibly a control of the self-organization of a system of interacting bacteria. So here's the outline for today. Uh, first of all, I will, give you, uh, I will give you some details on the interactions at play in this system, which are quorum sensing interactions. Uh, I will then move into the physics of what's going on, uh, just giving you some details about motility-induced phase separation phenomena. And finally, I will move uh, on my actual PhD work, which is 
the generalization of these concepts to ecosystems of bacteria, so uh, systems that are made up of many different species living together. So let me start by quorum sensing. So by quorum sensing, we define uh, um, a particular type of interactions by which the cell density uh, is uh, modulating some biological function. And this is a mediated interaction occurring in bacteria, meaning that uh, each bacterium is exchanging with the other some chemicals, and these chemicals, in turn, can trigger these interactions. So let me give you some concrete examples. Uh, one that you can find in nature is bioluminescence in these zebra fishery bacteria. Uh, when these bacterium is swimming alone or at very low cell densities, nothing happens. But then you start to increase the density of these bacteria, and at that point, they start to exchange with one another these small molecules, like signaling molecules, that are called autoinducers. And these autoinducers, in turn, can uh, regulate the genetic expression of some particular proteins. And the proteins that they regulate are responsible for bioluminescence, which means that here we have a mechanism that's density-based, uh, beyond which, beyond a certain threshold, uh, we observe uh, the appearance of some biological phenomenon, so in this case, bioluminescence. Now, what we would like to do is to use this quorum sensing mechanism to control another biological function, which is motility, for example. And so the question is whether we can use quorum sensing as a pathway for self-organization in active systems. Short answer is yes. Uh, this has been engineered in uh, bacterial strains, uh, in a work mostly uh, uh, around uh, 10 years ago. Uh, the key idea is the following. Uh, you have these engineered bacteria that exchange uh, these signaling molecules, AHL. I, I mean, it's not important the name, it's just these signaling molecules. And these signaling molecules, in turn, they regulate the genetic expression of some protein, GZ, which favors swimming over tumbling. So, all in all, what happens is that at high cell density, these bacteria eventually tend to stop. At low cell density, instead, they tend to move freely. And this is observed uh, when you change the cell density of your Petri dish. You look at the relative uh, the diffusion coefficient of these bacteria, and what they observe is indeed a drop at high cell density, meaning that actually this mechanism is working. So these AHL autoinducers, they are a proxy for the cell density, and they give rise to a self-inhibition of motility, meaning that the density itself is inhibiting the motility of the particles. So what, go, what happens in this system? Well, what they do is that they put in a central inoculum, in a petri dish, uh, their bacteria. They let them grow over one day, and they observe the formation, the spontaneous formation of these rings. And I can show you a movie. I, I would like to show you a movie. So you see how from uh, this central inoculum over the scale, so these are Howers passing by, and you see how the system forms these concentric rings. And importantly, you must notice that these rings are alternate between dilute regions and dense regions of bacteria. So this is indeed a phase separation phenomenon between a dense region and a dilute region, and we would like to understand it with the physics of phase separation, in a way. But the question that now we would like to answer is why motility inhibition favors this kind of self-organization. So this brings me to the second point, motility-induced phase separation. But before speaking of out, this kind of out-of-equilibrium phase separation, I want to just refresh some notions of equilibrium phase separation. So at equilibrium, liquid gas phase separation occurs because of a competition between energy and entropy. You have energy that is basically cohesion attraction that brings particles together. You have entropy that tends to homogenize the system and the competition between the two leads to, if you are at sufficiently low temperature, leads to a liquid gas coexistence. That's standard equilibrium physics. Now, on top of that, we add activity. So these self-propelling particles.
OK, now we start. What I want to show you now is a system of particles with Leonard Jones interactions. So uh, at sh very short scales, repulsive, but at an intermediate scale, attractive interactions. At the beginning, there is no cell propulsion. So this is perfectly at equilibrium. And you see that the system basically is phase separated between a very dilute gas and a liquid cluster, a liquid bubble in the middle. And then we start to increase the cell propulsion. You see, this V parameter is the cell propulsion speed of the particles. I increase it again, and now what you see here is that the liquid, uh, the liquid phase has completely evaporated, and we have a fully homogeneous um, gas. But then if I increase it even more, we start to observe, again, the formation of, um, of a liquid. But now we're completely out of equilibrium, and this phenomenon is just dominated by the self propulsion speed. So what happened can be put here on a phase diagram. On the y-axis, you have the self propulsion speed. Here you have the density, and I have fixed the temperature of my particles. So first of all, here, that's the equilibrium regime, very low uh, self propulsion speeds. The first thing that you go do if you increase your speed is that you vaporize the liquid phase. And then you end up into this reentrant transition, which is called motility-induced phase separation. And that's the one that we have seen in the movie. And what's striking about it is that you can also observe it in the absence of attractive forces. So you just take repulsive forces, self-propulsion, and you observe this motility-induced phase separation. And now I would like to understand how this happens. So let's take, um, I think, the simplest scenario to understand the physics behind MIPS which is quorum sensing active particles. So the dynamics is the following one. You have this particle whose uh, velocity is uh, proportional to an orientation vector u into d uh, times a self propulsion speed. And then these particles, they change their orientation uh, abruptly with a typical rate that's the tumbling rate. And this self propulsion speed is regulated by the local density around yourself. And this is what I call quorum sensing in this uh, particular scenario. Then, what we have, what I would like to convince you about is that motility inhibition, so the fact that your speed decreases with the density, can lead to MIPS. So there are two elements that we have to take in mind. The first one is that active particles accumulate where, go, where they go slower. Now I'll try now to give you an experimental, like, an experimental reason why. So imagine there are regions in space where I move slower and others where I move faster. So imagine here I'm faster, here I'm slower. What happens is that it's more likely for you to find me here where I'm slower and I'm passing more time than finding me there. So that's the intuitive explanation of what's written here. But coupled to that, you also have the fact that um, there is motivated inhibition. So you move slower where you're denser. And now if you take these two effects combined together, you will have a positive feedback loop that amplifies density fluctuations and thus leads to motility-induced phase separation. And this is as regards quorum sense interactions, but something very similar can be understood if you think of repulsive interactions. Uh, because what happens is that your cell propulsion, your, sorry, your velocity can be split between a bare cell propulsion and the interaction bit. You put everything together in a mean fieldish way, if you want, in an effective speed along your orientation u. And this effective speed will take into account the bare cell propulsion and the effect, the projection of the total of all, of all the forces onto your orientation. And what, as you can imagine, repulsive interactions will act in such a way as to reduce your effective speed. And thus, steric repulsion actually behaves in a way as a motility inhibition, and can thus, by the same reasoning above, lead to motility-induced phase separation. Sorry, um, yeah. uh, is this uh, uh, motility-induced uh, phase separation uh, independent of dimension? Do you have it uh, in all dimension, or do you yes. have a lower critical dimension, an upper critical dimension? So, um, no, it can be, it is found at all dimensions. Uh, actually, even in one dimension? Even in one dimension. Oh. Both also, in, you can see that in simulations, but also with, uh, with full theory. 
what can change this is the presence of disorder. So if you have, for example, if you imagine that your particles are moving on a, on a rough surface that can be modeled as a, say, as a disordered potential, in that case, it has been shown that it can lead to, um, uh, to having a lower critical dimension. That's three, if I remember correctly. So that's something very recent. But yeah, in general, in this very simple scenario, you have it in all dimensions. All right. Um, so I want to give you okay, some more quantitative insight on this uh, motility induced phase separation. So what we do uh, is to coarse grain the microscopic theory, so the dynamics that I showed you before, into a large scale hydrodynamics. And eventually, I won't show you how you do that, it's quite long, but the key message here is that eventually you end up with a mean field theory, uh, hydrodynamics that's basically a transport dynamics for your density field. And uh, the, the mass current is given by the gradient of some chemical potential. So that's basically a thick transport law, if you want. And now if you look at the detail of this chemical potential, it can be written as the derivative of a free energy functional, of an effective free energy functional, which in terms can be expressed as the integral of a free energy density over space. And now let's give a look at this free energy density. So there are two terms competing with one another. There is one which is very resemblant to an entropic term, and so we call it an entropy in quotes, uh, this rho log rho part. And then you have this part here, which we interpret as an effective energy for our model. I'm saying effective because, of course, this model is out of equilibrium. So there is no actual attraction between the particles. But from a formal point of view, we can call it an energy and an entropy. And so the competition between these two uh, gives rise to um, non-convex free energy, which can then be uh, which, on which one can use then uh, standard equilibrium methods like uh, common tangent construction and determine the gas density and the liquid density. So this energy, uh, the, this effective energy entropy competition is what explains motility induced phase separation at the large scale. So now let's put these into simulations. We simulate this system, for example, in 2D. And that's not yet what we want because you see that the system fully coarsens into, a, into a, um, a single bubble. So you, if you remember the movies that I showed you before about the bacteria, you had these concentric rings of finite size. And the physics of this thing so far doesn't give you any finite size selection. You just have things uh, that, take, uh, that, are, that scale with the system size. These uh, bubble scales with the system size. So there is still, still something missing. And Maybe for biologists, it will be more intuitive. For physicists, I mean, it was less intuitive, maybe. It's population dynamics. So of course, bacteria live and die and reproduce. Um, and if you add to your MIPS theory uh, this logistic growth term, this will stabilize finite wavelength. And I'll try now to justify what's going on. But maybe just to make sure we, are, we all agree on this. So the first lambda rho part is basically an exponential growth of the density. This second part here is such that it saturates the growth to a carrying capacity rho naught. So that's basically a logistic term. So why does it stabilize a finite wavelength? Because now you have two competing mechanisms uh, for the formation of, a, of the liquid. So first of all, you have the mass, uh, the mass flux. So all the particles come in inside a liquid droplet, for example. Uh, and the, this flux is proportional to the surface of the droplet. So if you're in 2D, that will be proportional to the radius. But at the same time, inside the droplet, you have mass variation. So you have loss of particles due to this uh, term here. And this will be proportional to the volume of the droplet. So the competition between these two terms is what stabilizes a finite size. And in particular, it will fix a ratio between the surface of a droplet and a volume. And so it will fix a particular a particular size. So this, let's make a recap so far. We have seen that motility induced phase separation plus population dynamics leads to a selection of uh, patterns of finite size. So this is what we have seen so far. So quorum sensing interactions are interactions that make the motility density dependent and can lead to MIPS, motility induced phase separation. Population dynamics, meaning a finite carrying capacity 
can lead to wavelength selection. And these can give you a qualitative explanation of the experiment. Uh, for example, in the simulations that you had here on top, this is the simulation of this model, and you see pretty quite well reproduces the, um, the experimental results. Um, but what about complex ecosystems? So that's the um, thing. Uh, so, sorry, yeah. I, I missed one point. Sorry, I was not. So this density dependent motility mm -hmm. is also due to static inter because essentially what is, uh, is also due to say the, the crowding effects. It can be. If you, if you include steric interactions, it can be. So for, but it's not necessary. So for all the models that I will show in, also in the following, I will just speak of quorum sensing interactions, neglecting completely steric interactions. I will mm. neglect the steric repulsion. But you can effectively account for that uh, as, um, so you can effectively account for steric repulsion as an, uh, an effective motivity inhibition. Mm -hmm. um, no, because that in one dimension is quite important. Uh, yes, yes. Three dimension maybe is much less important. No, no yeah, in, uh, in one dimension, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, okay, I'd, I'd have, okay, I'm not sure, okay, because, okay, with quorum sensing interactions, you do get motility induced phase separation in 1D. Uh, now that I think about it, I'm not sure about uh, what happens with static interaction, so that I would check. For sure you get it in from 2D on, but I'm not sure about 1D in, if you just have static interactions. For quorum purely quorum sensing, you can. So with particles that can interpenetrate each other, you can. All right. Um, so now I would like to tell you something about what happens when you have multiple species living together. Uh, so complex ecosystems, and that has been the focus on, of my PhD work. So I would like to discuss the self-organization of active mixtures. So I will start with a very similar, basically the same model as before. So run and tumble particles in 2D, for instance. But this time we have two strains that are labeled with an index alpha and beta. Uh, the dynamics of a single particle is the same as before, so you have a run phase with a self propulsion speed of p, and then you tumble and you change your orientation. Now we have these additional specification of the species I belong to, but that's, yeah. So yes, in our models, yes, uh, that's what we, that's what we do. I would guess so. I'm not even sure how, so for the coarse graining, for example, I don't know how these would affect it, and that's something that would be worth checking. Also because in there is a work by Eric Clement in uh, ESPCI. Uh, their, ex in their experimental group, they have studied uh, is the motion of E. coli bacteria, and I've actually shown that the distribution of tumbling times is not exactly uh, a Poissonian distribution, but there are actually some important corrections to that. And I think that, yes, it would be nice to incorporate these effects, but so far we just keep it a uh, simple Poissonian process. Okay, so here we just have these, uh, these uh, standard dynamics. Then on top of that, we now consider quorum sensing, uh, which means that the self propulsion speed, this time now depends on the two different density fields, so rho alpha and rho beta. I will speak of motility inhibition in the case in which B uh, decreases with rho, otherwise it will be motility enhancement. And now in this scenario here, there are way more complicated uh, possible interactions because you may, you may have self-interactions, meaning that my speed is regulated by particles of my same type, cross interactions between different strains, or global interactions by which the speed of one particle is dictated by the overall density around it. Um, okay, so what we start by doing is to simulate this model, these dynamics here, and see what happens. So we start by considering self-inhibition uh, coupled to global enhancement of motility, uh, meaning this, basically. And what you see here on the right is the phase diagram that we obtain from this uh, system, and the axis correspond to the density, to the homogeneous densities at which we initialize our simulation for the two species. So there are quite different colors. I'll go into that in a moment. 
Let's start by the white regions. Those are the boring ones in which you scatter your particles around, you look at the system, it remains homogeneous. So white regions are the boring ones. Yep. So if you want, yes, I mean, uh, you can also, it's very analogous to what you would see if you have self-inhibition and cross-enhancement. The nice uh, bit of, these, uh, of, of the physics here is the um, interplay between the two species. Uh, but, so I don't, I'm not sure if I understand what you mean by redundant. You mean by the fact that you account, in a way, the effect of one species is taken into account in the two parts, both in the self and the total part. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think, okay, yeah, yeah, I think the phase diagram will maybe clarify this point and then we can discuss it later. Um, so yeah, the, the first part here of the phase, phase diagram is quite boring. So it's just a one species phase separation. So imagine you initialize your system here at the start. Then you follow this dashed line, which is called tie line of phase separation, and you end up at two points, the extremes of the segment. These two points, they give you uh, the phases in which the system has phase separated. So you see that here there is, uh, the tie line is vertical, so it means that the density of alpha particles in the two phases is basically the same. And these you can see here, the, the density is uh, homogeneous for alpha. But beta has a, a beta poor phase and a beta rich phase. So you see actually uh, these motility induced phase separation but just for one string. If you go in the middle uh, and follow these tie lines, you will see that you have two uh, uh, demixed phase, in which you have an alpha rich uh, phase and a beta rich phase. And these, again, you can just look at the extremes of the tie line and that's informative on the kind of phase that you have. Finally, you also get a triple phase coexistence uh, with alpha rich patches, beta rich patches, and well mixed regions. So here, the static phenomenology is very rich, uh, at least it's quite rich, and we want to understand it starting from the microscopic theory. That's our goal. So, same as before, we start from the microscopics. We do the coarse graining, which corresponds to taking a diffusive limit and doing some ETO calculus. And we end up with a stochastic field theory that has this form here. There is a mass transport term, as before, the gradient of some chemical potential, and there are fluctuations. And this effective chemical potential takes into account the log of the cell propulsion speed and the log of the density. Right, so now that we have this field theory, we would like to squeeze something out of that. So one thing that we have tried was to say whether in some particular cases it could be time reversible. So what we do is that we compute the entropy production rate for this uh, field theory, meaning that we compute the average over all realizations of the field of the log uh, of the ratio between the probability of a forward going trajectory and a backward going tra uh, trajectory in time. So I'm, I'm not sure if everyone is familiar with the concept, but one thing that you can uh, keep in mind is that if the forward and the backward trajectory are equally likely, this ratio goes, uh, is equal to one, the log is equal to zero, and this entropy production rate is zero. Otherwise, if you have some time irreversibility, this quantity will be positive. Um, all right, so, okay, we ask ourselves what's this quantity in this model and whether it can ever be equal to zero and the answer is yes. There are some cases in which this sigma, this entropy production is equal to zero. If that is so, then this, this dynamics here is effectively an equilibrium dynamics with an, uh, with an effective free energy F and a probability, a stationary probability for the density fields that goes as the exponential of these, um, um, of minus this effective free energy. 
So what are these cases? Well, uh, we look for the, for the condition uh, for equilibrium, and we find this relation, which at first sight might look unintuitive, <laughs> it was for us too. Uh, so the, the derivative of the log separation speed of alpha particles with respect to the density of beta is equal to the derivative of log separation speed of beta particles with respect to density of alpha. So the intuitive idea that we grasp is that the way in which beta particles affect the motility of, of beta uh, sorry, beta particles affect the motility of alpha must be reciprocated by the way in which alpha particles affect the motility of beta. When this holds, we get uh, an effective, uh, what we have called a generalized action-reaction principle at this field level. But in, in all in all, this means that we have an effective macroscopic free energy. And once we have a free energy, you can build analytically your phase diagram using common tangent construction. And what you now see on the right is the comparison between the colored regions obtained from our analytics and the black lines corresponding to the simulations. So there is a very good match, which tells us that our theory from micro to macro is effective in describing the emergence of static patterns in the system. But of course, this only is valid when we have this condition here. So to sum up, we have started from an out of equilibrium dynamics at microscopic scale. And when this condition holds, we ended up with an equilibrium field theory. Now the question, of course, is what happens in all the other cases. So this brings me to the last part of the talk. Uh, we ask ourselves what happens when this condition is violated. We take self-inhibition coupled to no reciprocal cross-regulation of motility, uh, meaning that we violate the condition before. And what we observe are dynamical patterns in the case in which we have opposite cross interactions, meaning that alpha uh, enhances the motility of beta, but beta uh, inhibits the motility of alpha. So let me show you some movie, hoping that things won't, okay. Yeah. So we start with our, our homogeneous system, with particles scattered around. And eventually, we observe the formation, the spontaneous formation of a self-propelling band, where the red particles are chasing after the blue ones. We have a variety of um, dynamical patterns, for example, this chaotic band. Okay, or another one that I like. But that's hopefully gonna be the last movie. Maybe. Okay, so here you see the two, the two strains. And after a while, red tries to invade blue. And so this sets on a basic, basically an intermittent dynamics between the two strains chasing after one another. And my supervisor said, it looks like my cat's playing Okay, so, um, yeah, we have tried to get, get some quantitative uh, understanding of how this happens, and we have done basically a, a linearization of the field theory. I will not into the, go into the detail of that. I will just try to give you an insight of why this happens. So again, what I told you before, active particles accumulate where they go slower. But on top of that, we have motility regulation between the two strains. So, Motility inhibition means that I will slow you down, we will spend more time together, and so this means that motility inhibition plays the role of an effective attraction. At the same time, motility activation plays the opposite role. I activate your motility, I speed you up, we spend less time together, so effectively motility activation plays the role of a repulsion. But now if we take the two of them together, this creates a sort of frustration because Alpha, which is inhibited by beta, will accumulate in beta-rich regions, so it will slow down. But beta will be activated by alpha, so it will speed up and run away. Now alpha is activated by the lack of beta particles, so it will chase after them, and this will set on the run and chase dynamics, which is the microscopic origin of the patterns that I was showing to you before. And Finally, I'd like to conclude by going a little bit beyond this 
theoretical fantasies and go into another experimental realization that has been done with two bacterial strains. And this time we have orthogonal quorum sensing circuits, uh, meaning that uh, you have two strains, A and B. And A produces a particular chemical signal, these blue dots here, that binds to a receptor in B and regulates the expression of some gene in B. On the other hand, B produces some chemical signal, the yellow one, which binds to receptors in A and has an effect uh, on uh, regulating the genetic, genetic expression in A. So you have two pathways of genetic regulation that are not interfering with each other. If now you engineer the system and then put the bacteria a central inoculum, let them grow, that's what you observe. This is the same Petri dish, but three different fields of view. You have the one, uh, one strain of bacteria that's marked green, the other strain that's marked in red, and the two of them together. And you see that they form these demixed rings. So again, these will okay, okay. So you see that it's the same Petri dish, again, but three different visualizations. And you see that spontaneously, it forms these concentric rings. So this is, if you want, is a realization of the demixed phase of an active mixture in an actual b uh, bacterial system. Finally, one just last remark is that, again, here we see some finite size patterns, so these rings. And this is because on top of the theory that I've shown you before on, for MIPS, one has to add population dynamics. So this brings me to the conclusions. Um, well, I have shown you that quorum sensing interactions uh, can lead to self-organization in bacterial systems. Using coarse graining methods, one can draw a, dry, a direct connection between the microscopic and macroscopic dynamics of the systems and um, the, 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 joint, um, the joint phenomena of motility induced phase separation and population dynamics can lead to finite size patterns. Uh, in the final part, I have shown, I've talked about active mixtures as a model, as a possible model for a bacterial ecosystem of many species interacting together. And as a new direction that we're now exploring, for example, we're trying to study a very large ecosystem that is made up of many different species and trying to model that using a random matrix theory and that's a collaboration that we're now doing with uh, Adal Thierry in Paris. I thank you all for the attention and I'm glad to take any question. Thank you. Thanks. Um, and you showed um, different examples of uh, engineered strains mm -hmm. where uh, in the lab the people were able to reproduce uh, these, these patterns and these mechanisms. And, and this is not uh, like, this is just curious, this is not provocative, but are you aware of a uh, uh, like situation where uh, you actually observe this without the need of engineering? Like, it's nice to, to engineer it and see that everything is consistent, but Either, uh, either those patterns are present or something like this plays some role of biological relevance in the sense of uh, like, uh, yeah, this. Yeah, uh, that's actually a very good point. And no, uh, the short answer is no, not that I'm aware of uh, for wild type bacteria. Uh, the point is that uh, there are very complex ecosystems. I'm thinking of uh, the gut microbiota or the, um, or for example, uh, uh, the rhizosphere, so the, all the bacteria that are living at the roots of, uh, of plants and trees. And those are very difficult to, so I mean, it's very difficult to pinpoint exactly which interactions they have, which chemicals they exchange. So it's very difficult to say, oh, these interactions can actually be there in, uh, in uh, real bacteria, in wild type bacteria. That's not been observed, that's for sure. Uh, what I think is cool about these experiments uh, is the fact that we have some control of uh, self-organizing uh, biological systems that are quite complex, and we have some understanding of that. And maybe it can be used in a way to, to produce self-organizing patterns in a, 
intelligent way that's maybe the, the long run. But yeah, the short answer is no. <laughs> um, well, this question is the question that shows that I didn't understand anything. <laughs> Can you come back to the, to the part of the entropy where you write the sigma, please? Yeah. Uh, Yeah, so um, for what I understand of the active particles that you have to feed them constantly with some chemical uh, potential or, well, an agent, a molecule. And in principle, these are processed out of equilibrium. So you are taking the entropy or that sigma is a measure of entropy? So that's, I think, a very good point that you're, that you're making. We're hiding something under the rug, that's the point. When you do the coarse graining, you forget about some degrees of freedom that are the orientation of the particles. And the fact that you have, microscopically, it's true, it's, an out of, it's always an out of equilibrium process, even when these sigma, whatever that is, is um, equal to zero. Microscopically, you always have an out of equilibrium process because these particles are always fueled with some energy that they need to self-propel. So uh, for sure, the full dynamics, if you could also keep track of the, of, the, um, of the orientation of the particles, for sure you would have a positive entry production. When we look at this theory, however, we have coarse grained out the orientation degrees of freedom. So you're looking at less degrees of freedom. And this theory can be actually something that's time reversible. So that's what's going on. But the problem is that you cannot relate this entry production rate to some production of heat in the system. It has no, say, thermodynamic interpretation because you're forgetting the sources of, uh, of energy, the input of, of energy inside your system. So I don't know if that makes things Yeah, it, it may, was, it, yeah it makes kind of sense because and then when you define uh, the distribution, like the exponential of the, yeah. this free energy, Mm -hmm. That is because, okay, it is out of equilibrium. You have this measure of entropy equal to zero because you are forgetting about the microscopic details or and just taking it like yep. from zoom out. But then it is still not clear where you can take the like uh, an equilibrium distribution for the. So. Okay, if I just started, if I didn't tell you all the story before, and I give you this equation up here. Yeah. Okay. Um, if this u can be written as the derivative of some free energy functional, that's an equilibrium theory. Yeah. Okay. We're doing the reverse. We have the chemical potential, and we ask ourselves when and whether it can be written as the derivative of some free energy. When that is, that occurs, you can show that the stationary distribution is a Boltzmann one. Okay. And one way to show it, if you want, is to write a Fokker-Planck equation for this density. It's a functional Fokker-Planck equation in this case. L you look for a stationary solution, uh -huh. and that will be uh, an exponential of minus f. Oh, I, it was my mistake because I was thinking equilibrium, but this is stationary. Then it makes sense. Any other question? So, if not, then uh, thanks, uh, thanks again, Alberto, thank and um, we'll see you tomorrow at night.